Okay, so in this video, we want to discuss the idea of sigma notation. And this idea is to write out summations in a very compact form. So let's look at an example. Suppose we have, say, n real numbers. Suppose I have a 1 is a real number, so I'm indexing my real numbers. I have a 1, then I have a 2, then I have a 3, up to, say I have n of them, up to a n. So all of these are real numbers. A1 could be 5 over 7, A2 could be 3 quarters, A3 could be negative 1 over 8. So n real numbers, so 1, 2, 3, up to n. And suppose I simply want to add these n real numbers. So I want to write A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus dot 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 up to a n. Now I want to find a different way of writing out the summation so as to write it more concisely and also to avoid this dot dot dot. Well, there's a few parts to this notation. The first one is, well, what kind of letter could we use to represent a sum? Well, the idea is we'll use an S, but we'll use a Greek uppercase S called sigma. So this is a Greek letter that is an uppercase S and it is called sigma. So this stands of course for a summation. So we are summing, we are adding up terms, and how do we capture the change, right? The index is changing. The index is 1, then it's 2, then it's 3, then it's 4, up to n. Well we need a, what's called a dummy variable, to capture the change in the index. We'll use here the letter i. So i starts, so the role of i is to capture the index, 1, 2, 3, up to n. So i begins, this is called the lower bound of summation, where the summation begins. The summation begins when i is equal to 1. And this will be called the upper bound of summation, where the summation ends. It ends with a n, and here i is n. But we don't rewrite i equals, we simply write n. It's understood that because i here is equal to 1, this is i equals n. So what this means is you have to sum as i goes from 1 to n. So i being an integer will go from 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, up to n. And we sum what's up front. Well, what's up front is a i. And this is the idea of sigma notation. So if you go backwards, we are summing a i, where i begins at 1 and goes all the way up to n. So this would be a 1 plus, when i then is 2, plus a 2, plus when i goes to 3, a 3, plus up to when i equals n, plus a n. And that's sigma notation. Before we look at properties of this notation, let's look at just a few examples to make sure we understand what this represents. Suppose I say sum summing i going from, let's go 1 to 4, i squared. Now I'm saying sum the terms i squared as i goes from 1 to 4. Well. When i is 1, we have 1 squared. Plus, well, after 1 is 2, we get 2 squared. Plus, after 2, of course, i will be 3, and we get 3 squared. Plus, and finally, i reaches 4, and we get So the summation of i squared i going from 1 to 4 means we're adding up i squared as i ranges from 1 to 4, so we get 1 squared i equals 2, 2 squared plus i equals 3, 3 squared plus i equals finally 4, 4 squared. And you can evaluate this if you want, right? So this is 1 
plus 4 plus 9 plus 16. 1 plus 9, 10. 10 plus 4, 14. 14 plus 16 is 30. So there you have it. I could, of course, and you'll see why we say that i is a dummy variable, we can replace i by, let's say, j. And we'll have the same result. If you look at this summation, let me replace i by j. So I'm summing from j, going from 1 to 4, j squared, and we'll get the exact same expression, right? This is saying sum the variable j squared when j goes from 1 to 4. So when j equals 1, we get 1 squared, plus then j equals 2, we get 2 squared, plus when j equals 3, we get 3 squared, plus when j equals finally 4, we get 4 squared. So we get the exact same expression. That's why we say i is a dummy variable, because you can replace i by another variable, and you get the same summation. Let's look at one more example. <coughs> what if I said I'm summing i going from 1 to 3, i over 2i plus 1? Well, I'm summing now these terms as i goes from 1 to 3. So first i is 1, we get 1 over 2 times 1, 2 plus 1, 3, so we get 1 third. Plus when i is 2, we get 2 over 2 times 2, 4, plus 1, 5, plus, finally, when i is 3, which gives us 3, over 2 times 3, 6, plus 1, 7. And, of course, you could add these up and get a, an answer as a single fraction. I'm going to leave that up to you. The point is now you're okay with how to use sigma notation. Let's look now at properties of this notation, of summations, and you'll see that all the properties which we'll prove are very straightforward, and this will really be helpful when we deal with problems of areas under curves. These properties, although simple, will be extremely useful. So I will list the properties first, and then we'll prove them. So properties of sigma notation. So suppose we have here two lists of real numbers. So suppose I have the first list, a1, a2, a3, up to an, so n real numbers. And I have another list of real numbers, say, b1 through bn. So b1, b2, b3, up to bn. Those are also real numbers. And let me take a constant, k, also being a fixed real number. And let's look at the basic properties of summation. What if I ask the sum, as i goes from 1 to n, summing just k times a i. So the question is, what can we do with the k here? Well, we're summing with respect to i, so i is changing. But with respect to i, k is a constant. So with the first properties, we can move constants out of the summation. So the sum of k a i is simply k times the sum of a i. So first property, which we'll prove very shortly. Second property, what if we sum, as i goes from 1 to n, a sum of two terms, namely ai plus bi? Well, the property is we can sum the terms individually. We can first sum separately the ais, and then add the sum of the bi's. And the same would work instead of a addition if we had a subtraction. So if I sum from 1 to n, 
the difference between AI and BI for every I, that's the same as summing first all of the AIs and then subtracting the sum of all of the BIs. And those are the three fundamental properties of sigma notation. So think of it very simply. You can move constants outside of the summation. If you're summing a sum of two terms, you can split up into individual sums. Same for a difference. If you're summing a difference of two terms, you can split up the, two, the, 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 the two summations and then subtract both sums. So let's prove these properties now. And you'll see that the proofs are really, really straightforward. We're simply going back in each case to the definition of sigma notation. So we'll take the sum, expand it, and then recontract it. So if I write the first one, so summing i going from 1 to n, k times a i, the property claim that we can pull k outside the sum. So let's prove this. Let's expand. We're summing k times a i as i goes from 1 to n. So when i is 1, we get k times a1. Plus, then i is 2, we get k times a2. Plus, then i is 3, we get k times a3. Plus, dot, 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 all the way up to finally when i is n, we get k times a n. And now the property is pretty obvious. Every term that we're summing is multiplied by k, so we can factor k outside. And we have k times a1 plus a2 plus a3 all the way up to a n. But if you look at this, what is this? This is the sum of a 1, 2, 3, up to n, so the sum of ai, and i begins at 1 and ends at n. So in the end, we're left with k times our summation. And this completes the proof. The sum of k times ai is k times the sum of ai. So first property is proved. Let's prove the other two properties. So let's sum ai plus bi. So when i is 1, we get a1 plus b1. Plus when i is 2, we get a2 plus b2. Plus dot 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 up to finally when i reaches n, we get a n plus b n. Well, we're summing real numbers. We can rearrange the real numbers in any way that we want. So let's put all the a's together. So this will give us a 1 plus a 2 plus dot 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 plus a n. And then we'll add all the leftover b's, b 1 plus b 2 up to b n. And now, the result should be fairly obvious. If you look at the first sum, well, again, this is the summation of a i as i goes from 1 to n. The second sum is the summation of the b i's as i goes again from 1 to n. So, finally, what are we left with? First the sum of the ai's, then plus the sum of the bi's. And this completes the proof of our second property. If you add ai plus bi, you can add the a's first, and then add the b's. So if you're summing over a sum of terms, you can split up into individual sums. And now you can imagine that the proof for the subtraction will be basically the same. So let's go over it quickly. So 
AI minus BI. <coughs> Let's expand again. So when I is 1, we get A1 minus B1. Plus when I is 2, A2 minus B2. Plus all the way up to when I reaches N, AN minus BN. Well, we'll play the same game here. We'll pull all the A's together. They're all positive. So this will give us A1 plus A2 plus dot 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 plus AN. And all the B's are negative, so we can factor a negative from the B's. And if we factor the negative, we're left with positive B1 plus B2 up to plus BN. And once again, we recognize the sum of the AIs minus the sum of the BIs. And this will complete the proof. So there you have it. Now that we have this notation, how we can write sums in very compact and concise ways with the sigma notation, the next question is, do we sometimes have shortcuts or do we always have to evaluate summations by adding every single term or are there special sums that can be evaluated with shortcut formulas? And the answer is yes and we'll consider those summations in our next video.